Hello and welcome my friends for this month's iteration of Guelph's History Bites, a monthly program that the Civic Museum puts on covering a wide range of topics. Last month we discussed toys and the different kind of children's entertainment uh, goodies that we have in our collection up at the museum. This month we're covering something a little differently, uh, a little different, looking at um, Guelph's kind of Scottish history or Scottish traditions that are preserved in the city's history. My name is Robert Fluelling. I'm a visitor experiences assistant with the Guelph Civic Museum, and I'm also studying a master's in history at the University of Guelph, focused on early Canadian history and Canadian colonial history. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to you know take the time to reflect and do a bit of a land acknowledgement, you know, acknowledging that this land that we're on today, uh, and the kind of between the rivers, the two rivers here has been the kind of traditional lands of the Anishinaabe people, specifically the Mississaugas, Mississaugas of the credit, but also the Atawandron and the neutral peoples in the past. Uh, we are close neighbors in close proximity to uh, the six nations of the Grand River um, who are situated on the Grand River territory. Um, and of course, uh, Guelph today is, is home to many different First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples as well. Um, and, you know, recognizing that um, it's uh, even talking about things like this, Scottish history and, and, you know, Robbie Burns Day and then January 25th and Haggis, that all of these things, you know, are, are intersected, you know, intersectional. They, history is contingent upon itself. And through examining the context of colonialism and, um, you know, settling in the area and that ramifications or those ramifications for Scottish history in Canada, um, we can kind of explore the historical past to help us inform our current reality. Um, so with that being said, let's dive right into it. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never lost a mind? Should old acquaintance be forgot for old lang syne? For old lang syne, my dear, for old lang syne, we'll take a cup of kindness yet for old lang syne. These are the words of the, the, the Scottish national poet, Robbie Burns. Uh, for the poem Old Lang Syne. It's traditionally read or sung or played on New Year's Eve when we're, you know, gathered together in merriment. But over the past few years, because of the pandemic, we, you know, haven't been able to get together in the same fashion. But still that poetry, as old as it is, is there for us, you know, in those, in these times when we're not necessarily there physically for each other. And with, it's with this poem that I want to open up this month's iteration of History Bites, Old Lang Syne, exploring Scottish connections, Scottish traditions within the city of Guelph. And I think it's fitting because, you know, when we're talking about poetry like Old Lang Syne and, and the words of Robbie Burns, you know, tradition and, and the way we connect with identity is kind of how we connect with each other. And Scottish traditions and Scottish identity was with Guelph since its founding. And those are some of the kind of things we'll explore today. So we're going to kind of look at three different aspects of Scottish identity that is President Guelph or has been President Guelph. We're going to look at poetry and literature um, through the works of Robert Burns and John Galt. We're going to look at music, specifically pipe music and the uh, history of the Guelph pipe band. And lastly, we're going to follow it up with a kind of discussion on dance and the way that um, Scottish dance uh, has influenced Guelph and still continues to influence Guelph. Um, throughout these kind of different topics, we're going to jump back and forth between time and show how things are connected and interrelated. And we're also going to, whenever possible, uh, connect to the contemporary age as well with um, how these traditions are still um, maintained and played out. Before we get into those things, I want to provide a little bit of context or historical context for why Scottish traditions like Robbie Burns and Old Lang Syne or the Address to the Haggis is so widespread, so international. Um, and it kind of we have to go back a few hundred years to basically the complicated relationship, <laughs> complicated is an understatement, but the complicated relationship between Scotland and England. Um, without spending too much time on it and giving you a history lesson you didn't necessarily sign up for, 
Scotland and England haven't always had the most positive relationship because of Scottish nationalism and Scottish ideas of sovereignty. That is the idea of Scotland existing outside of the British Empire. England, and, and, and you know, I single out England here because the kind of traditional center of the power of the British Empire was located in England, was located in London. So despite England and Scotland both being part of the British Empire, you know, policies were developed and still are developed in England that affect Scotland without much Scottish input. We'll kind of leave it at that. Essentially, during the 18th century, so the 1700s, due to a long history of complicated events, there was a series of kind of uprisings, rebellions, revolutions, and these Jacobite risings, as they were called, um, tended to have a lot of Highland support. That's not to say that the Highlands in Scotland themselves were unified in their support of the Jacobites, because we know that not to be true, but they tended to be um, very Highland oriented because of the way the clan, the Highland clans operated under. Um, they had a certain sense of autonomy and, and independence as well. So they found a lot in common with the Jacobite risings. So the, the, these movements, although not Highland specifically, tended to have a lot of Highland influence in them. Why this is important is because in response to these risings, um, specifically the uh, Jacobite Rising of 1745, um, England through the or through the British Crown, the British Crown decided to implement a series of policies that looked at undermining traditional clan hierarchy and authority in Scotland, specifically in the Highlands, but also in the Lowlands and the Islands as well. Um, so we know them these today as the clearances or the you know, the Highland clearances, but also just the clearances generally, because again, they took place in the lowlands, in the islands, um, following the Jacobite rising well into the 19th century, the 1800s, almost up until um, Canadian Confederation in the 1860s. Now, these clearances, they were kind of advertised as a way of helping to combat poverty, um, combat famine and food insecurity, because um, there was many different... Um, periods of famine in Scotland and Ireland as well, right, due to um, climate or um, disease uh, targeting certain crops like potatoes, right? Um, so the, the Crown argued that if it could um, relocate people from rural settings into urban populations, they could be better, you know, looked after. Now, in interestingly, like, right, like, like I've already mentioned, a more cynical approach is that this was done to undermine, you know, Highland authority or the traditional clan authority by separating tenant farmers from their landlords and um, you know relocating the power and control over the land in the crown. Um, some some historians have also noted that this was a really useful way of getting soldiers for the British Army and the British Navy. Um, upwards of seventy four thousand men, presumably from the Highlands, um, fought in the Seven Years' War in North America and, and elsewhere, and the Napoleonic Wars in the continent out of a population of about 300,000. Um, so, you know, if you separate people from their land and their ability to look after themselves and the ability to make money, and then you offer a good job as a soldier, you're gonna have probably a lot of recruits, right? Um, so generally these clearances, these Highland clearances, separated people from their land and created um, land and food insecurity. Um, this is coinciding with British imperialism and British colonialism, right? Britain has many colonies all over the world in Australia, India, um, Hong Kong. There's a lot of Scottish people that end up there, but obviously for our sake, a lot of Scottish families ended up here in North America, specifically in Ontario. Many Scottish families left under duress. Um, and by duress, I mean, you know, we're, we're separated from their land and kind of forced out. Um, many Scottish families or Scottish individuals also left under their own volition, right? Seeking their own passion and their own ambition. So like I said, a lot of Scottish families, a lot of Scottish individuals ended up in Canada, whether in the Maritimes, passing through to Quebec into Ontario, even into the prairies with the Selkirk settlement, um, you know, which eventually leads to things like the Battle of Seven Oaks and the Louis Riel Rebellion. But again, that's a history tale for a different time. But the point being, um, Scotland, Scottish people, Scottish traditions were widespread across Canada during the period leading up to Confederation and colonialism. Um, so many, many individuals, but um, or many families, 
you know, farmers and things like this, but, you know, many high profile individuals are, are historical giants. People like George Simpson um, from Dingwall in the Highlands, uh, sometimes known as the Little Emperor, uh, ran the Hudson's Bay Company from 1821 to 1860 um, and, and dominated, you know, dominated the Hudson's Bay Company and really turned it around. Um, the Hudson's Bay Company being a, a huge, huge tract of land in, in, in much that covered much of Canada, which was eventually sold um, to Canada and forms much of what we call Canada today. Kind of, as you can tell, I've really driven, really driving home the point here of the, the role that Scottish people played in the British Empire, in British colonialism. And um, one of the main reasons why I'm doing this is because we're going to focus on you know, Southern Ontario today for our purposes because of Guelph and Goderich and these things, um, because of John Galt. Right. Uh, John Galt is someone I'm going to talk about a bit more in depth later, but working for the Canada Company, which itself is a land speculation kind of organization that was chartered with settling one million acres um, acquired, uh, known as the, uh, the Huron Tract, uh, acquired through the Between the Lakes Purchase in 1792. Now, the Between the Lakes Purchase or surrender or agreement was some was an agreement reached by the British Empire and the Mississaugas, uh, the Mississaugas First Nation, Mississaugas of the Credit. This agreement is complicated because in the, the way it was recorded in colonial sources or the way that we have historically viewed it as colonial, as settler colonials is that it was a purchase or a land surrender. But scholars and activists and, and people just generally more and more each year, indigenous and settler alike are beginning to question that and say, you know, the, the evidence and the context and the spirit and intent of those treaties um, really points to the understanding that, well, the, the, it was more of a mutual understanding of a land sharing agreement because the land cannot be bought and sold. This is an entity unto itself that cannot be really exchanged in this way. So the Mississaugas, even at the time, are recorded as saying, well, we can't exactly sell what we don't own, but we can agree to a land sharing agreement. Um, and why I'm, I'm, I'm spending time on this is because, you know, all, although Scottish families and individuals left Scotland under duress, right, because of the clearances and, and these sorts of things and settled in Southern Ontario, they did so in places like Guelph at the expense of First Nation people, right, at the expense of, say, um, the Six Nations of the Grand, if they're settling in Galt or Kitchener, Waterloo, Brantford. Um, or at the expense of even the Mississaugas themselves when settlers are pouring into the area around Guelph, when, you know, the original agreement was a land sharing agreement rather than a land sale. So the point being here is how can the Canada company, how could the Canada company have sold something to individuals that didn't necessarily, was not necessarily available to be sold? Um, important to spend time on that and, and kind of create that, that context backdrop in your head do we go forward um that being said in 1827 uh again through the canada company charter uh john galt um was kind of the major one of the major minds behind the canada company and he was responsible for the settlement of guelph establishing guelph as a an attractive place to live he was um a, a scottish person from irvine in scotland he lived in Greenock, was the son of a um, naval captain, a merchant. Um, so he was ambitious. He was um, he was an entrepreneur and he also kind of had a, a himself had a love for adventure. Um, he, like many other young men or young individuals in Britain during the kind of Victorian era, 19th century, um, spent a good deal traveling in Europe um, on, on these kind of grand tours, right, where you hop on a boat and you visit Italy and uh, travel all over the Mediterranean and Greece. Um, so he was one of these individuals kind of seeking inspiration. Um, John, John Galt on these travels actually met and formed an acquaintance with another kind of perhaps an even more, more famous uh, uh, British intellectual, Lord Byron, the poet and also Greek war hero who eventually died in Greece, in Greece um, fighting alongside Greek rebels. Um, so 
you know, John Galt, despite being the founder of Guelph and kind of this colonial bureaucrat, is also part of kind of um, a larger intellectual literature, um, tradition of literature, um, you know, alongside of Lord Byron and people like Sir Walter Scott. Um, John Galt is up there as far as the poetry and literature that he produced, um, and as far as inheriting the traditions of earlier poets like Robert Burns, who we will talk about um, in more detail shortly. Um, the point here being is that in 1827, the city was founded, um, and by the kind of 50s and 70s, it is incorporated as a town and a city. Um, Guelph became an attractive place to settle because of both its proximity to agricultural centers, its proximity eventually to railways, and its proximity to large urban centers that had already been established. Now, again, what does it have to do with Scotland? Like I said, al although, you know, when we're thinking of these early times as British colonialism and, and British endeavors, um, high portion, a large portion of the people working on the ground as colonial officials are Scottish, right? Either through the Hudson's Bay Company, through the military, or just through um, seeking their own ambition, like John Galt or George Simpson, right? Um, so when they come to these places and settle and, and establish themselves, they are bringing with them their Scottish traditions as well. Um, so in many ways, this is religion, Presbyterianism and the Scottish church, right? Or the Scottish um, Protestant church. So you see that in smaller um, towns like Kirkwall, like Kirk being the, the Scottish word, for church, literally named after the presence of the Scottish church, right? But um, I, you know, I, I, you travel long enough in Southern Ontario, you'll find Presbyterian, Presbyterian churches everywhere, as well as Anglican, right? But you, you can really see the, the specifically sc specific Scottish roots here. Um, and so these traditions are established very, very early on. Um, so again, going back to John Galt, right? He's, he's a poet and he's a writer, a novelist operating in kind of the same intellectual sphere as people like Lord Byron and Sir Walter Scott. Um, Sir Walter Scott, whom you've probably heard of, is also is another Scottish poet um, who wrote things like um, the, the Scottish chiefs and Rob Roy wrote about William Wallace, uh, the maid of Perth, all of these, all of these wonderful, wonderful, like kind of romantic Victorian age literature. Um, but he is often being often credited with being very instrumental in forming this idea of Scottish identity and Scottish tradition. Right? In 1822, so about five years prior to the founding of Guelph, King George IV um, traveled to Scotland for a royal tour. Now, King George IV was the first monarch to do so since uh, 1652, um, with Char um, since Charles. Um, so it had been a long, long time since a monarch, an acting monarch, had visited Scotland. So this was a big deal for Britain in general, but also for Scotland, right? And Sir Walter Scott worked closely with King George and the kind of powers that be to, um, you know, play out this visit in a very specific way because of mounting tensions of people dissatisfied with English rule in Scotland. Now, one of the most striking things about this tour was that King George... Um, through the advice of Sir Walter Scott, was dressed in Highland regalia. Now, this is important because when when, when you think of Scotland today, you you, you, you will picture bagpipes or kilts, right? These kind of cliche stereotypical or stereotypes of what Scotland is. But that wasn't that wasn't necessarily always the case, right? Because you know the things like uh, you know Highland or like um, pipe music, um, Gaelic language, the kilt and tartan. A lot of these things are more regional, like more perhaps um, centered in the Highland culture rather than the Lowlands, right? But with this royal visit, King George wore Highland regalia. So he wore kilt and a tartan and the bonnet and high socks. Um, and you're thinking, you may be thinking, okay, well, what's the point of that? Well, up until then, or up until recently then, all of those things have been outlawed. Because during those early Highland clearances uh, following the Jacobite Risings, Highland regalia, Gaelic language, pipe music, um, the tartan, all of those things had been outlawed. They'd been banned by the crown, by England, um, because they were seen as being symbols or sim um, emblematic of the Jacobite cause because of the Highlands role in supporting Jacobitism. Yet King George shows up on his royal tour wearing the Highland regalia, right? And it becomes a fashion trend. It, it blows up. People all over Britain are starting to wear kilts and tartans and associate themselves with clans, whereas that once necessarily, may have more necessarily been a Highland aspect, right? 
Now, I said those things were outlawed, and that isn't necessarily true. The tartan and the kilt and the bagpipes, they became permissible in the military. For example, this tartan, or uh, this pattern here, is often associated with the Black Watch Regiment, um, the, the 42nd foot, or, or, or it's different iterations, it's different names. It's the, the Black Watch, that's the Scottish Regiment in the British Army fought all over the world. Many Scottish soldiers in the Black Watch eventually settled in, in Canada right, um, following their military service, um, specifically because often they would pay soldiers in land, and that would be often more attractive than actually being paid in, in money or, or whatever. So they often took land in places like Canada as, as a payment. Um, so the tartan and, and kilts and those things were preserved in the military. Now, we'll get to the significance of that later, uh, a bit later, but right now I just want to kind of you know, flag the, the importance of this early period, you know, of symbols, of identity, Scottish identity. What does it mean? What, is a, what does a Scottish person look like and sound like, right? And, and these things are rapidly changing, due in part to people like uh, Sir Walter Scott, um, but also because of the much earlier work of Robbie Burns, which is, you know, being revisited as well, or, or you know, perhaps people never stop visiting, but it is um, finding new platforms and new, and new places as traditions are being reapproached. People are trying to reestablish connections to their language and their culture, right? Um, so Robert Burns, um, you know, operating in the mid 18th century, is writing poetry like Old Lang Syne to be uh, addressed to the haggis, um, and talking about, you know, very distinct Scottish things by writing in Scots dialect, right? Scots itself as a language being different from English, right? Um, so he's writing in this kind of distinctly Scottish dialect, right? And these traditions, these traditions being established here by people like Sir Walter Scott or much earlier by Robbie Byrne, are carried to Canada by Scottish immigrants, by Scottish soldiers, by Scottish colonial officials, and they um, are finding root here. They eventually become, you know, Canadianized and, and, be, and have their own distinctive identities, but there still is a very strong connection between the Canadian the Scottish Canadian families living in, in diaspora and um, Scottish Scotland itself. Now that we've established some of the kind of origins and you know, context of Scottish tradition in the city of Guelph, I want to talk about some more specific examples of what this looked like. Uh, first, I'm going to move through kind of poetry and literature um, through folks like John Galt and later John McRae. Um, then I will look at um, music and the role of music uh, in Scottish traditions, um, specifically around Ralphie Burns Night, but also on events like Remembrance Day. And then lastly, I will end off kind of on a more energetic note, talking about the role, um, talking briefly about the role of dance and um, Kind of different different dance forms as um, ways of communities coming together and connecting. Um, of course, while I talk about these things separately, they're all connected, right? So, for example, when we look at John McRae and his writings in Flanders Fields, we will also look at, you know, say a performance by the Guelph Pipe Band of them playing in the John McRae Memorial Gardens on Remembrance Day. So, remember that, like I said earlier, or um, history is contingent and connected. Context is important. Um, so, right, let's get into it. So, I kind of spent a good time talking about, you know, Victorian era Romantic era writings right, in literature. Um, for Guelph, John Galt, right, as as kind of the the founder of Guelph, or one of the founders, anyways, was himself a novelist and and a poet. He wrote many, many, many works: um, Agamemnon, the Annals of the Parish, like all of these different pieces. Some of them um, even have critiques of you know, our um, critiques of colonialism in, in, a, in a way, at least as much as John Galt could muster kind of in his time as, as himself being steeped in colonialism, right? So although he was a colonizer and actively engaged in this land speculation, land appropriation, he still, at least in his writings, whether he believed it or not, or it was just for his audience, he still um, was able to apply uh, a, a bit of a critical lens. So you can read his writings and and, and you know, judge that for yourself. But it is, he is an interesting writer for that reason. Again, right, as he's working with the Canada Company, you know, he is also writing, right? He's also got a, a bit of a creative kind of artistic side. Like I said, he traveled extensively, or at least was acquainted with and traveled alongside Lord Byron in 
the Mediterranean in Greece and, and, and Sardonia and other places. He ended up writing one of the first, auto, um, no, not autobiographies, one of the first biographies uh, for Lord Byron after Lord Byron's death. Um, much of what we know of the Canada Company um, comes from John Galt's autobiography, um, which is his, you know, him writing about his own life. And so he wrote um, extensively about the company as well from Crown, more of a critical lens. Again, um, critiquing it, he was fired <laughs> or canned and ended up being jailed when he returned to Britain for failure to pay debt. So maybe he was a bit, you know, bitter or salty, but again, read the works yourself and, and come to your own conclusion. But like I said, an extensive writer, um, kind of inspired by, um, I guess, some of his, his workings here. And now, you know, we can, again, we can critique those things themselves, right? Because, oh, you know, you're finding a muse in the new world, right? And, oh, the wilderness. But we know it's, it was neither a new world um, when Europeans came here, nor uh, an empty wilderness. So again, John Gold is kind of establishing, you know, this bit of a... Um, literary tradition, right? And later on, we have Lieutenant Colonel John McRae come along, right? Born in the late 1800s, he fought in the Boer War and he fought in World War I. Uh, he was a very intelligent, creative person. He was also a writer, an illustrator. Um, he was a medical practitioner, a doctor. He studied in, in Montreal and Toronto. And so when it came time to enlist, he naturally gravitated towards um, Surgery and, and medicine. Um, he is noted as, as being a soldier first, and then and then a doctor, um, rather than kind of operating on the back lines. He preferred to fight on the front lines, um, alongside the soldiers. Um, so it kind of adds a bit of that, you know, emotional, emotional baggage or emotional kind of backdrop to his writing of in Flanders Fields, um, you know, which he wrote on the front after the death of one of his friends. Um, but again. Um, John McRae, McRae um, is part of the Scottish tradition, right? His grandfather moved into the area, um, Thomas McRae, moved into the Guelph area, set up a few businesses here, set up a business called the McRae Woolen Mill, in which you know, wool, was, wool was spun together to create fabrics and those sorts of things. And so, you know, again, he's, we're looking at a time period that's, you know, entering into the the 1900s in World War One, but he's still part of a longer Scottish tradition in Canada that's slowly becoming Canadianized, um, but it still has its strong roots. And so I, I say this because, um, you know, John McCree died um, due to tuberculosis or, or some sort of lung infection, but he had a brother, um, Thomas, named after the grandfather, who had, um, who had children. Um, one, of, one of Thomas's children's name was um, David name it's complicated right you know they're very creative with names so thomas's child is named david david mcrae named after john and thomas's father david um, but david mcrae also goes on to become a lieutenant colonel we have here in, in our guelph collections a letter preserved sent by david mcrae um around the time of the holidays um now it's a little hard to read, so I'll, I'll kind of you know sum it up. Basically, he's thanking his friends for the well wishes, and he's wishing them well in return, hoping that they have good food, especially haggis, as well as um, plenty of wee drams or wee drops, um, a reference to whiskey. So this idea of you know Scottish traditions coming through in the holidays for Hogmanay or, or, or Robbie Burns and all these sorts of things is still being preserved there with the emphasis on haggis and wee drams of whiskey. Um, so I. You know, when we see that in the, in the literary tradition and the writing, the connections between John McRae or John Galt or even earlier traditions connecting Haggis and the uh, address to the Haggis to Robert Burns, um, those connections remain strong. Um, interestingly, you know, um, uh, this it kind of, you can kind of dive down a bit more of a rabbit hole here because the McRae Woolen Mills um, in the employee of the McRae Woolen Mills is a man named Thomas Brown. Now he marries, um, he marries an individual um, whose name is Jane Emma, Jane Emma Thomas, or Jane Emma Brown. Um, she is the granddaughter of Robert Burns, and she has two children, Gina Moore Burns Brown, and another, Isabella. Now Isabella tragically dies um, at the age of 10 while the family is living in Guelph, and she is 
actually buried in Woodlawn Cemetery, the great granddaughter of Robert Burns. Um, now Thomas, um, Thomas and Thomas, the um, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Brown, they eventually moved back to Scotland and, and that sort of thing. Um, but it, you, know, you, you know, you can see my kind of you know crazy or my uh, little bit of pulling threads here, but um, they all worked at the McRae Mills, so or um, at least Thomas did. So you have this kind of direct connection between the Burns family and the McRae Mills, who kind of John Gold sandwiched in there somewhere else, also. Just a weird little fun history fact that you can throw around at, at, uh, at dinner. Um, so with that kind of literary aspect looked at, right, and, and again, keeping in mind those the kind of lasting traditions of Robert Burns, um, we'll kind of, we'll look at music, right? Because again, all these kind of traditions, again, are connected. So when you're having social gatherings, right, there will often be music and food and dance. Um, and, you know, these things are kind of captured in, in poetry, right? So, for example, when we're looking at Robert Burns, the address to the haggis, uh, you know, the haggis is piped in by, by a piper, and then uh, the poem is written out or read out, you know, often in Scots um, or sometimes in English, depending on the context. Um, you know, we have some great pictures here of our, uh, our friend Seamus um, at uh, the museum's events that we've run in the past for Robert Burns, uh, Robert Burns Day. Um, so you can see here, again, images of the haggis being piped in and then Seamus uh, reciting the poem. Um, now, one example of, you know, well-established musical traditions is the Guelph Pipe Band. Now, they were formed in 1922, about 100 years after George IV, George IV visited um, Scotland on his royal tour. Um, they were formed in 1922, so a few years after the war. Um, we have some great images here um, of the Guelph Pipe Band, and you can note in these images uh, that they're dressed in, in that Highland regalia that I was talking about earlier, the bonnets, the kilts, the tartans, right? They have the full kind of military regalia, and that's because pipe bands are kind of holdovers or, or um, heavily attached to the military, to the army. They often were parts of regiments, right? Like the light foot regiments or infantry regiments, you know, often the army will um, include bands and of uh, like marching bands and those sorts of things. And so, like I was saying earlier, when a lot of that early Gaelic High Highland Scotland music and, and dress, kilts, tartans, all those sorts of things were banned, those things were preserved in the military. So we lost, unfortunately, a lot of that early or a lot of that traditional pipe music. And what is preserved today is often military tunes and marching. I mean, there is efforts to, you know, um, dig up those old tunes from before the bands and those sorts of things. But uh, the majority or a lot of the music that is preserved, such as on these records that we have in our collection from the 60s of the Guelph Pipe Band are military tunes. Um, so, I mean, if, if you spent a, a good amount of time in Guelph or in, or in Ontario, uh, Southern Ontario cities, um, often high school graduations will be accompanied by a piper or pipers will be present in parades. Um, you know, Scottish music, at least through the bagpipes, has become a well-ingrained part of Canadian tradition. So, you know, for, for example, when I graduated from the Fergus High School, there was a bagpipe, you know, and despite, you know, rediscovering my Scottish roots now, but didn't have stronger Scottish roots at the time, my kind of history or my, you know, experience in Ontario became ingrained with Scottish traditions, despite not actually having Scottish roots myself. But again, you know, going back to the Gulf Pipe Band, they were present pretty early on in the history of Gulf at least, you know, in the more recent times, such as 1922, which is 100 years ago now, right, itself. Um, and the Guelph Pipe Band is a well-reputed, well-renowned pipe band. They've performed in many different competitions in North America and in Scotland itself and, and um, are highly accolade, um, have many accolades. Um, so I'd like, I'd like to play some examples here, um, courtesy of the Guelph Pipe Band. Um, first, we're going to watch some excerpts from their uh, virtual Robbie Burns dinner last year. Um, we will watch a few segments of Pipers playing. We will watch um, a three-piece band with some fiddlers. There will be a, a bit of dancing as well as um, a, a bit of a clip of, of the address to the haggis itself accompanied by um, its pipe and then, and then read out. Um, We'll follow this up with a bit of um, 
a clip from their performance at the uh, John McRae Memorial Gardens for Remembrance Day last year, which was also virtual. Um, so enjoy, and we'll come back in a few minutes.
ye honest sonsy face. Great chieftain of the Poon race, I burn them all at your place. Pinch, try, or them. Why are you worthy of a grace? As langs me arm. The groaning trenches there they fill. Ya heard these like a distant hill. Ya pin would help to mend a mill in time of need. But through your pores the dews distill. Like amber bead. His knife, sir. His knife, see rustic labor time. And cut you up with ready slap. Trenching your gushing entrails brick like only ditch. And then, oh, what a glorious sight. Warm, reeking, rich, and horn for horn, they stretch and strive. They'll take the handbills on the drive. The other well swelled kites alive are bent like drums. And good man must like to ride. <clears throat> Be thank it, Hans. Is that there, ye French review? Wally all what stole a suit? A fricassee what made a spew with perfect scunner? Look down with sneering scorn for view at sick of dinner! Oh, Ardell, see him over his trash, as feckless as a weathered rash. His spindle shank a good whiplash, his knee a nip through bloody flood and field of dash, a one fit. But mark the rustic haggis fed, the trembling earth resounds his tread. Clasp in his wally knee a blade, and he'll mock a whistle with legs and arms and heads will snit. Like pots at thistle. Your powers that make men kind your care. Dish them out their bill of fare. Oh, it's got them once nice stinking wear that strips and luggies. But if you wish a grateful prayer, <laughs> yeah, a haggis! <laughs>
something about, you know, something about the bagpipe just wants me to make it, you know, get up and do a bit of a jig, right? <laughs> Hope your headphones were maybe turned down a bit. Um, but there you have it, right? The, 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 you know, the different ways in which Scottish traditions are still maintained and, and preserved despite the pandemic. You know, we, we often talk about the pandemic discourse and how hard it is for us to get together as individuals, but through perpetuating our traditions or, or Scottish traditions, for example, in the virtual element, we can still connect to each other, albeit not physically, right? Again, um, the, the, the golf pipe band uh, has that kind of lasting presence. Um, here's some more images of them at the sequicentennial in 1920s, or 1977, a sequicentennial being 150 years. Um, many um, huge, large parts of that celebration in Guelph incorporated Scottish elements. So you can see here um, Scottish elements in the parades itself, but then also here at the Guelph Armory, some photos of a kind of of a Scottish celebration. So dancing, there's a haggis again with this image. Um, and there's also this great image of Premier Bill Davis um, taking, taking a spin of the bagpipes. Uh, not, the photograph doesn't include any comments as to whether he was good at it, but it looks like he's struggling a bit. So um, again, the, this, you know, when going through the archives, all these images just keep popping up. You know, if you search the second centennial, you're um, bound to find these elements of Scottish tradition here, whether it's through the piping, the haggis, and the, the, the address to the haggis, or again, Bill, uh, Bill Davids here with, um, with his attempt at being a piper. Um, and it's, you know, through the preservation of these, these, these traditions, or, or the preservation of these traditions, is often through social groups. So, from very early on in the founding of cities like Guelph, um, at least in the kind of tradition of the British Empire, you often have social groups. I mean, you have the Grand Masons and those kind of weird secret societies, right? Um, that you know, by nature being secret societies, you don't know much about, but you also have groups like the Order of Scottish Clans or the kind of another smaller group that my great grandmother was part of, the Jean Kennedy Auxiliary, which is a subsect of the Order of Scottish Clans. Um, you also have things like the Burns Club, right, which is a club dedicated to preserving and maintaining the art uh, and, and culture of Robert Burns. Um, for example, this poster from 1859, uh, advocating or um, advertising for a Burns Night Supper, right? Um, you, you know, music will be there and dress, you know, costumes are, are encouraged, right? Um, so that's an example of how very early on in Guelph, um, it's communities were still finding ways to connect to each other based on their heritage and their traditions. And, you know, we have some great archive, uh, archived material in our collection, such as this handbook from the Order of the Order of Scotland, or the Order of Scottish Clans, um, kind of dictating how the women's auxiliaries should be run, you know, treasurer and chaplain and these sorts of things. My, grand, my great-grandmother was a chaplain in the, in the uh, Jean Kennedy Auxiliary. And yeah, so again, it's, it's through these social groups that we're able to remain connected to each other, um, in our own communities, but, you know, connected to the communities that our families left, for example, when Scottish families left and kind of entered into diaspora and emigrated out as part of the kind of colonial, British colonial process, you know, again, they brought those traditions with them, their food and their music. And, you know, they also brought with them dance, right? You know, what's, what's a good, you know, you know, you get a good haggis dinner and you, you have a few grams of whiskey and someone starts playing the bagpipe. Well, you're going to get up and start and cut foot loose, right? Kevin Bacon, <laughs> dirty dancing. So um, dance is also a very important aspect of many of these social gatherings. You've probably heard of a Kaylee, which is this, this, this kind of, you know, one of these events that happens at night where the whole kind of community gets together and they just start throwing down, um, you know, the fiddle and the pipes and the singers. Um, there's often a caller who, you know, will pick and choose what dances are done, whether it's like a round dance or, you know, maybe we're more used to in our in our rural Ontario our square dancing, right? But you have the country dancing and the round dancing. Um, and, you know, again, when, when we're talking about music and dance, often the lines between Scottish and Irish are not blurred, but they're they're they're. Um, they support each other. They come. They come hand in hand. Often, Scottish music and Irish music, or Scottish dance and Irish dance, often come under the umbrella of Celtic, right, or Gaelic ballad. Um, sometimes it's just called traditional, right, traditional music or traditional dance. Um, so we have some great, again, great images here of 
you know, these dances, kind of snapshots of these dances, right? People in movement, people live, um, you know, flying through the air, spinning and dancing in in their sashes, curtain sashes. But should I get up and do a dance for you? No, <laughs> I'll spare you. Um, instead of me dancing, why don't we watch this little clip here? First, um, we'll introduce my friend here, Megan Fuller. Um, she is a well an alumni now of the University of Guelph. She's from Ottawa, and she has been dancing for most of her life. So let's listen to her speak briefly about the importance of dance um, to her and her family, and and then we will watch uh, a few videos. We'll watch two videos: one of Megan at like a more um, formal competition, and then another of Megan and I together in Scotland in Dundee at a bar or at a pub called Speed. Um, uh, called Speedies, and uh, yeah, it's great. It's a lot of fun. Um, she's dancing to, uh, and all in the background are musicians playing, and so that it's a lot of fun. So let's watch those two and kind of get a good sense for like uh, for dance and, and the kind of you know the voiceless traditions that we we carry through. Hi, I'm Megan, and I've been a step dancer for the last eighteen years. Music and dance has always been a huge part of my life since I started dancing when I was five years old, and it's really just given me some of the most incredible experiences in my life so far. The thing that I love most about trad music and dance is the community behind it. I've made some of the most incredible friends in my years of performing and competing, and over the last two years due to COVID, we haven't had any in-person competitions. We've been doing virtual, which obviously isn't ideal, but it does take a lot of effort to organize. And it just shows the sense of determination in keeping fiddle and step dance alive, which is super important to me. Um, step dance is also just a really fun party trick to have because it is kind of a lesser known form of dance. Um, so when I was in Scotland, I joined the Trad Music Society there and they had weekly jam sessions at a local pub. And I don't play any instruments. I can only dance. <laughs> but everybody there was super welcoming and had no problem just letting me jump in for a couple tunes every now and then. Um, we ended up performing together later on, and it really just introduced me to some of the most incredible, talented people. Um, it's always just a good time, and it brings out the best in people. Oh, yeah. 
again, just like the bagpipe music earlier, it's really something that gets you up once you, you know, get your feet tapped and start start grooving with the grooving with the tunes. In addition to a lot of the photographic material that we have in our archives, we have some really great physical material as well. For example, take a look at these photos of something what's called a canter. So a canter is kind of like a part of a bagpipe in that it's just the the kind of flute part. Um, and now a canter is used without the kind of the bag, as it were, as a way of practice and practicing tunes. Um, it's an instrument in its own right, but it's often used more as a practice instrument. Um, so you can check that out, you know, here. As well, we have in our collection um, many different textile materials. So we have, um, you know, kilts and sporins, um, children's uniforms and things like this preserved. We have some on display in our city exhibit right now, although the museum is closed due to the pandemic. But we still have, uh, you know, these uh, collections digitized as well for you to search through uh, our website. Um, you know, we have these more traditional garments like, you know, sporins and kilts and these sorts of things. But take a look at this hat, for example, produced by Biltmore. Um, so Biltmore Hats was a very famous um, hat company here in Guelph. This hat here, um, produced by Biltmore, has a tartan or is made with a tartan pattern, this plaid pattern. I believe Biltmore called it maple leaf tartan or something like that. But you can see how the different ways in which, uh, again, Scottish traditions are being kind of interwoven into the material culture and preserved within our museum. Um, like I would like I will allude to later, you know, we have even stranger artifacts like this turnip cedar. Um, which was used, you know, to seed turnips, to, to, to plant turnips. Um, now, why specifically turnips? Well, turnips or neeps is a integral part of the haggis dinner, right? You have haggis, but you also have neeps and patties or potatoes. Um, so turnips is also a part of the food culture in which, um, you know, turnips alongside potatoes are being grown on southern Ontario farms, but they are themselves used and very much part of Scottish diet, Scottish traditional, or the Scottish traditional haggis, anyways. Um, anyways, back to, back to music, I, you can tell I love food or perhaps I need lunch, but for music as well, like I spoke at length about the Gulf Pipe Band, we have some of the very early records as well, pressed on vinyl um, of, uh, from at least 67 or the 60s anyways, of Gulf Pipe Band music being preserved not only, um, you know, the Gulf Pipe Band playing at events and, and different traditions and ceremonies within the city, but also being produced and distributed by more uh, audiences at large. Um, as a, you know, it, and it kind of goes to show the importance and the, the desire, you know, for consumption of these of these traditions. So, I mean, I could go on and on on that all day here about, you know, Scottish traditions and these sorts of things. And um, were it, you know, non-pandemic times, we would have visited Trotter's Butcher and just and uh, get a glimpse into the making of haggis, which they do uh, in January in anticipation for Robert Burns Day. Um, we would have, you know, maybe had some musicians or dance, but, you know, because the pandemic is ongoing, we have to be creative, you know, about preserving our ability to communicate with each other and to connect with each other as community members. Um, we will always find ways to do that. And, you know, it's through these kind of virtual things uh, that we can remain connected. And so thank you for joining me today. Um, I look forward to joining you again in the future. This has been a iteration of History Bites. I, I hope it was not too big of a bite and that I, and I hope that uh, you have a fantastic new year. And we'll see you soon.